If you prefer not to have a handout, just go ahead and open your Bible to 1 Corinthians. We're going to begin in chapter 1, and while we are here in Epiphany, that's the season we're in, thus the green, uh, quite a number of our Sunday New Testament readings are coming from 1 Corinthians, and it will pick up with Paul's Corinthian correspondence later this year. But until then, uh, until Lent, really, Lent, are you ready, Eric? Not me, you know? Okay, um, I want to start just sharing out of the Scripture from 1 Corinthians. So here we are, chapter 1, sermon title, There Be Saints in Corinth. I realize that's not quite in just, you know, like, but you're going to remember that, right? He didn't say R, he said there be, right? Something's got to come from the holler. I don't. There be saints in Corinth. Now, why, why title it that way, Sharon, especially at the beginning? Because if you've ever read 1 Corinthians after verse 11, you kind of wonder if there were any saints in Corinth. And so starting the, the series essentially this way, and focusing in just on Paul's positive statements in this, this first you know, two handfuls of verses is to insist, as he does insist, that no matter how you perceive yourself and how broken and inconsistent and struggling you are, God's promise is stronger than your weakness. That's where we're going to start. You may have lived a life of coldness. You may be distant to the Lord. You may be back and forth as to whether or not there even is a God. But if at some point in your life you've called out upon Him, I want you, as you hear this message from Paul this morning, to lay hold of those promises and to let the Spirit rekindle faith. So here's the first point. The Corinthians were called to be as saintly as all the other churches. Think about that. Again, if you've read through 1 Corinthians and you see the problems that they're dealing with, think about how majestic a promise this is, that God is calling them into the same fellowship that all the other churches have with Him, and He's given to them that grace to be transformed, as saintly as all the other churches. Paul writes, To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together, you can't be a saint by yourself. You can't. If you're going to be a saint, you've got to be around people and experience the sandpaper of personalities that you don't like. Anybody who lives alone can be a saint because the only person you've got to deal with is... And some days that's difficult. Don't acknowledge that to yourself or to the church today. But if you're really going to move into the image of Jesus... That's only going to happen in community. And oftentimes, the Lord puts us around people that sandpaper us. What's the, what's the name of that? Uh, is it, it's a geodisc. It's, like it's, like it's not a bag, but it's a particular device that you put a bunch of rough rocks in, and you put water in it, and you, you close it, right? And you let it sit. And while it's sitting on the desk or wherever it is you have it, the internal mechanism spins. And as that mechanism inside of it is spinning, and what happens is all of those very rough and difficult stones become as smooth, depending on how long you leave them in there, as glass. Because the friction of those things rubbing up against each other causes them to become a different shape, a different touch, a different feel, even though it's still the same stone. We're called to be saints just like all the other churches. That's God's calling for you personally, that you would be a saint. As a matter of fact, by being in Christ, He's already made you a saint, theologically speaking, spiritually speaking. He's already done it. And your life of service is Him refining you, is rubbing off those rough edges. So what He's done on the inside of you spiritually becomes true of you practically. And that happens largely in the fellowship of the church the challenges, and the difficulties of life. Paul says, or the book of Acts, I want you to notice what the Lord Jesus says to Paul in Acts chapter 26. The Lord says, I have appeared to you for this purpose, 
to appoint you to serve and bear witness to the things to which you have seen in me and to those which I will appear to you, lay, show you later. He says, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The Lord was sending Paul to people who were not instinctively desirous to be in covenant with God. So he has to go to announce to them that they're out of covenant with God, that they worship an unknown God. And while they give him platitudes, it's not enough. But he's already provided for them to have complete and perfect fellowship with him through the merit of Jesus Christ. That's what it is to be saintly. It's to not trust our own righteousness, but to trust his. To be changed and transformed by him. And so whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether you're raised in the church or you've just come in off the street, whether you've been cold or you've been on fire, it doesn't matter. It's the one blood of Jesus that sanctifies every person the same way, making everyone a member of the body. And it's within that same fellowship, that, that, that singular bond in the spirit that we have that he makes us distinct people. But those distinctions and the various incremental increases towards practical saintliness, practical divinity that he works in us should never cause us to forget where we came from and the kind of transformation that he did in you because he wants to use you to help others in their own transformation of grace. There were saints in Corinth. Paul says this. He brings up the list of things that they had been involved in. In chapter 6, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Everybody comes from someplace. And the Spirit of God works in each one of us to get us to His place. And that process of transformation is something He never leaves us in. Oftentimes, when we discover something about ourselves, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you are a fitness guru, Jason. Maybe you're, you're on the path to towards being the next Mr. Universe. That's right. It's not in his head. Yes, that's right. <laughs> you're working that. You're doing that. You're, 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 you're out there and you're, you're, you know, feeling the pump. I don't know, whatever. That's <laughs> what you're doing. And then, you know, Thanksgiving shows up. Oh, man. And suddenly, for many people, how often does all that discipline and all that exercise go out the window? And what's supposed to be a cheat meal turns into a cheat eight weeks. So you go back into the gym on, a, on January, and everybody's in there for that 48-hour period for their resolution. <laughs> and they're getting ready to go, and they're really working it out. And how many people never go back because they so disrupted the rhythm that they created for themselves that they took pride in and they defined themselves by that when they were confronted with what they still were, they couldn't bear the sight of themselves. And you see, we do this morally all the time. We do it spiritually all the time. We set a, a, a commitment to the Lord that we're going to preserve a certain hour of a week or a, a time, like we're going to get up at 3.30, Four, amen, uh, in, uh, amen, um, a.m. in the morning, and we're going to pray and we're going to seek God. And because we only wake up at five, we don't pray. Well, I've missed my resolution. I guess I've just am not going to serve the Lord. Don't be foolish, right? How often do we do it? Don't raise your hands. But we're confronted with ourselves. When we see what we still are, we can't bear it. I want to give you this encouragement. The Lord already knows. He already knows about you. 
He already knows what your problems are. He already knows the stupid decisions you're going to make that you don't know about yet. And none of it undercuts his love. None of it undercuts his commitment to you. Because you are not why he's committed to you. He's committed to you because he loves you. Because he chooses it. He has decided to create you. And he has decided to become flesh and die to reconcile you. Why would he start something and quit midway? Every time I see the sunrise, I see it set. What he starts, he finishes. Paul says to them that all of these people, and this is not the only vice list he gives, by the way. He gives plenty of others in other passages of the New Testament. And he says none of that will ever inherit the kingdom of God. And the people who engage in that behavior will never inherit the kingdom of God. And before the dis- dis- sets in on them, because some of them are still acting like that, he says, but you've been washed, you've been baptized, you've been reconciled to God, so stop living into the fallen nature and start obeying the grace that's come to you in Christ. What great hope and promise is that? Secondly, this morning, the Corinthians lack no spiritual graces. Could you imagine attending a church where they didn't lack a single spiritual gift? Think about that. I was thinking last night about a, uh, a period of time I was uh, at a church uh, when I was in college, and, and Becky and I were attending, and almost every Sunday for that, what were we there, about eight months, I guess, that last year uh, we were there, like almost every Sunday was one explosive service after another with the kinds of signs and wonders and healings and miracles and stuff that you just don't believe unless you're in there watching it happen, right? And it continued in that particular church for another couple of years after we left, and because I, I went to take a church as a pastor. Um, and then, you know, it's, it stopped, and it, all the things that tend to happen, happened. But for that period of time, if there was any need that you would have had, you could have gone in and, not, I won't say all the spiritual gifts were there, but maybe 80% of them. I mean, you'd walk in and you had a thought about maybe the Lord was talking to you about something and you'd say, hey, so-and-so, can you pray for me? And they say, sure. So you sit down on the pew, they start to pray and suddenly they're disclosing like Daniel what you were thinking immediately or had a dream or a vision about to, the, to, the, to detail. It's just incredible. Or you needed a healing or, or a, the demons were flying out of people. All kinds of stuff that you hear about. Could you imagine what it would have been like to be at Corinth? Paul says they're enriched in all speech, in all knowledge. He's not talking about how they communicated nicely to each other, because he's going to bring that up how they don't do that later on in the letter. He's talking about a particular quality of spiritual gifts. That's why he spends so much time talking about uh, prophetic or spirit-inspired speech to them in chapters 12 and 14. They're enriched in everything, and they're not lacking any gifts. As a matter of fact, when they start to argue with him and rebuff his authority, it's because they're claiming to have more of the Holy Spirit than he does. And he quickly turns that around and he says, if you had half as much as you think you do, you would be beaten about as much as I am. Because one of the other evidences of being filled with the Spirit is the conflict from the world and the hostility of the devil and the rejection of people who don't want to grow near to the Lord. That's what it's like to be filled with the Spirit. But at this point, he says nothing is lacking in your faith. Nothing is lacking in your experience. He says to them in chapter 12, To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another working of miracles. You know what the difference between a healing and a miracle is? A healing is you're sick and you get better. A miracle is you were dead and now you're alive. There's a distinction there. One is a work of power. Uh, a, a healing is when Jesus prays for somebody who's blind and they can see. But a miracle is when he walks upon the waves. We say only Jesus did that. That's not true. Simon Peter did too. And that account there is not so we can read it and say, wow, Peter was so great. He sinks. The account is there to say that Jesus bid one of us at any time if we believe him to step into the chaos and suddenly find that we're not swallowed by it. 
These people aren't lacking in any gift. That's actually an indictment that Paul will point out later on. Because they've received so much of the Spirit. How much more ought they to be conformed to the image of Jesus? One of my favorite preachers, Leonard Ravenhill, wrote in Revival God's Way. Did you ever read that one? In Revival God's Way, he said, the, this is in 1983-84. He said, this, I won't name the city. He said, this city in such and such a place in the United States boasts 123 churches that are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's a lie, he said. God took 120 people in the upper room and changed the empire. If one of those churches was filled with the Holy Spirit, that city wouldn't be the same. We must not use our experiences to say we've grown into maturity because God gives people who aren't converted yet graces of the Holy Spirit. i give you another contemporary example. Keith Green. Josh, that's your guy. Your man, Keith Green. Before Keith Green converted, he cast a demon out of his buddy Harmony in the back of a van. You got to know Keith Green and that bouncing hair he had. You know what I mean? <laughs> Say, how did he do that? Well, he just quoted the Bible and this thing manifested itself and left out of his buddy. He wasn't even a Christian yet because it was the Word of God. If we ever... And may the Lord be so gracious to do it for us. If we ever into a season where it's, we would know what this is like, where we don't know what it's like to lack in any gift, then and now, these words from Paul always apply. Make love your aim. Make love your aim. And earnestly desire the spiritual gifts especially that you may prophesy, meaning that you may be filled with inspiration to encourage, to exhort, to build up. Sometimes, sometimes exhortation looks like Mike Get Ditka coaching the Bears. But most of the time, that's not the kind of exhortation that we're talking about. Arthur, I think that one went like that. Who knows Mike Ditka? Y'all got it. <laughs> Thirdly, this morning, the Corinthians shared in a promise of blamelessness. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when you get to heaven and in front of God's throne, you're guiltless? How does that happen? I want to encourage you to come to Sunday school because we're talking about 39 articles and we're going to dispel bad notions like purgatory. That was a shameless plug. <laughs> but the promise of the Lord is the same. Notice what he says to these Corinthians. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says to them in chapter 11, because of the way they're abusing the Lord's Supper, that some of them have fallen asleep. Christians don't die because you died when you were baptized. When your physical body quits working, the Bible calls that falling asleep. Unless you're outside of Christ, then you died. He's saying that on the day of the Lord Jesus, you'll be presented guiltless. In chapter 11, he's saying, because you're abusing the it so poorly, the Lord's killed you all to make sure he gets you to heaven. Now, as disruptive as that is on the inside, if you're more focused on your present blessing and your present best life now, you don't hear the hope of the gospel in that. Because it's not to promote premature death. That's not what it's about. It's about God's promise that what He has initiated in us through Christ, He will bring to perfection and He will do whatever He has to do to make it so that we are guiltless before Him on that day. Another passage that does get overblown and used in ways that it ought not to be used, and as I've said about other things, I'll say it again, please uh, don't literally but tattoo this on your hand. Abuse and misuse lead to disuse. 
this passage of Scripture has been abused, and so people act like it doesn't happen, and it's this one in your notes, 1 Corinthians 3, 13 through 15. Each man's work will become manifest, for the day, the day of judgment, the day of the Lord Jesus, will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If a man's work is burned up, before I go on, let me say this. There's a lot of injustice in the world. There always has been. And I got bad news and I got good news for you. That's not going to stop. There's always going to be corruption. And there's always going to be people who look like they get away with it. But let me share something with you that needs to root in your soul and bust up that damnable stone inside your heart that says that God isn't just. And it's this. Shall not the judge of the earth do what is right? And if God today decided to visit this land like he visited Sodom and Gomorrah for the same sins, he would be right to do it. And anybody who thinks that they would escape the severity of that judgment, you still don't understand the Lord. See, that day is coming when no one will be able to say, yeah, but God, He will do what is right. And the, mag the majestic thing about the Lord's discipline, even that day of judgment, why is He trying their works? Is it so He can, or our works for that matter, why is He going to do that? Because He wants to afflict His people? No but because that fire is proving and testing everything so that at the end, we actually have a reward that's worth eternity. And so what we want to do when we know this is the command of God, we know this is the promise of God, we want to have, in the words of Jonathan Edwards, eternity stamped on our eyeballs. So we look at everything through that lens, knowing that He's coming again. And we don't want to invest our time. We don't want to invest our lives. We don't want to invest our energy and in all of the things of the world that will be burned up like straw. We want to be blameless on that day and our experience of the fire to be something that we are glad to offer to the Lord and not something that we're afraid of. Because the end result is going to be this. We will be so thoroughly sanctified that the glorification experience will be one where we are guiltless before the throne of God. In Romans chapter 7, Paul writes a good deal about the flesh. I could use Nate for that example like we did that one time when I kind of picked you up. You remember that, Nate? Don't forget it, buddy. <laughs> for those of you that are unaware, and I, I need to wrap it up, but you're unaware, in Romans chapter 7, Paul, he goes into that, I want to do good, but I can't do good. I desire to do good, but then I don't do it. And then I, I don't want to do the good, and then I do the bad. And he says at the end of the chapter, who will deliver me from the body of this death? This bo the body, yeah, the body of death. It's a definitive thing he's referring to that the Romans used for execution. Everybody knows how the Romans would crucify and how they would behead. Well, they had another way of getting justice. If you commit murder, one of the punishments that they would mete out is they would take the corpse of the person that you had killed and they would tie it to your body and you would wear it You'd wear the corpse on your back. And as that body of death decayed, because it wasn't for like a day, it was you were going to die. As that body decayed, the decay of that body would rot into your own and you would get sick and you would die from the infection. And Paul says that's what sin is. It's a body of death that's attached to me that I can't get rid of. Anybody who has ever had legitimate addiction you know you don't want it. And you can't seem to get rid of it. It's a body of death that's been strapped to you. A, a way of thinking, a way of destructive thinking that leads you into the same stupid decisions and getting the same stupid and even more stupider consequences. And I'm using light language compared to probably how you talk to yourself when you're coming out of it. This body of death. But Paul doesn't end with the body of death. You know what he says? He says, thanks be to God 
Who will deliver me from the body of this death? Jesus Christ. Because Christ has already died. And by being baptized, I don't carry around a body of death. I'm carried around by his body of life. I've been incorporated into him. He's taken me into the grave. And he's raised me up into heaven and seated me in heavenly places. And now he gives me grace to transpire figure to step over to walk upon these things that would reach up and cripple me if they could but thanks be to him who always leads us in triumphant procession there were saints in Corinth there are saints here stand with me Lord Jesus we thank you for your glory We thank you that your promise is true, that you have not left us as orphans, but you have sent your Spirit to be in us always. And I pray for every member of the body, everyone here, Lord, to learn to stop asking you to be present and to start thanking you for never leaving. In Jesus' name, amen.